Well, um, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Kate O'Regan. I'm the director of the Bonaberry Institute of Human Rights, and welcome to this, the second um, webinar in our series on slavery, past and present. And today we're going to turn to talk about issues of immigration and empire. Um, Sam will introduce our wonderful array of panelists, and I would just like to thank them on behalf of the Bonaberry Institute and thank Sam for um, participating and being willing to be here with us. And for us to say that this series has really been inspired at the Bonaberry Institute by our thinking about uh, issues that arose in last year around Black Lives Matter, about the history of uh, empire in the UK and the need to foster public conversations about that. It's also inspired to some extent by the fact that we are a partner in a group of academic institutions working on modern slavery. And when I'm delighted that one of the panelists here is actually hitting up the um, Policy and Evidence Center for Modern Slavery, Alex Belch, and he will tell you a little bit more about it when he speaks. But it seems to us that we like to fit our public events to the research work that we're doing. And um, there can be no better way of doing this than by hosting some of the leading experts in the field. So I'm going to hand over to Sam, but thank you to all the panelists and to all of you who are attending. Um, and I look forward to what I'm sure is going to be a really interesting conversation. Thank you. Hey, thank you. I'm delighted to be chairing these sessions. I'm a, a barrister at Matrix working in the area of uh, immigration, refugee law and, and modern slavery. And um, I'd like to thank uh, Bonavera very much for inviting me to uh, moderate these events. I'm here this evening with Wendy Williams, CB, HM Inspector of Constabulary and of Fire and Rescue Services, but most relevantly for today, the author of the Independent Lessons Learned Review into the Home Office and its handling of the events leading up to the Windrush scandal. I'm also here with Alex Bulch, Professor of Politics at the University of Liverpool, Director of Research at the Policy and Evidence Centre on Modern Slavery and Human Rights, and who co-edited the Modern Slavery Agenda. And I'm also here with Farida Banda, Professor of Law at SOAS, uh, at the University of London. Frida sits as well on the advisory board of Human Rights Watch Africa and the Policy Committee of Human Rights Watch and has a new book out, African Migration, Human Rights and Literature. So we're in very good hands indeed this evening in terms of our panelists. Each of them are gonna speak for about 15 minutes and then we're gonna have a Q and A. So whilst they're speaking and even before, please do um, start thinking about your questions, comments, and you can put them in the Q and A box at the bottom of the screen and I will aim to get to as many of them as I can. And we'll have plenty of time um, for questions this evening. The session is being recorded and it will be available to be watched later via the website uh, for anyone who's not here this evening and via YouTube. So the idea behind the three-part series was really to look overall at the past and present of slavery, both as a continuum and from different perspectives. So we looked at our first session at the history, the gaps, the blind spots, and the telling of the history, which are then reproduced today in the wider national narrative about slavery and empire. And today we want to look at the legacy of empire and colonialism and understand the wider impact that it's had on our society, including on our immigration system, our institutions and government, as well as our education system. And we can see just from a reading of headlines today, just how important all of this is. Concern, for example, about the impact of the hostile environment on the uptake of vaccinations by those who do not have legal status in the UK, debate, um, over the moving of the statue of Cecil Rhodes at Oriel College, Oxford, to get quite close um, to home for the Bonavera, and a debate about what the Labour Party means by patriotism. But a really good way of exploring some of these issues is to begin with the Windrush scandal and what can be learned from this, the link between the history of empire, decolonization, and the history of our nationality and immigration system is not familiar territory to many and certainly was not unfortunately to those in the home office who should have been aware of it when considering the cases of individuals caught up in the Windrush scandal. So Wendy I'm going to hand over to you now and Wendy's going to start by speaking about her role as the author of the review and the findings that she made and the aftermath. Wendy over to you. Sam thank you very much for the invitation. Um, by way of background, 
in the summer of 2020, no, summer of 2018, I was appointed by the then Home Secretary to head up the review into, um, sorry, I'm getting some feedback, to head up the review into the Home Office's handling of Windrush. And I was asked to conduct an assessment, as you've said, of the events leading up to the Windrush scandal and to identify the policy, operational and legislative factors, as well as other factors that led to members of the Windrush group being caught up in immigration enforcement measures that were designed for people who were in the country illegally. I was also asked to make recommendations to hopefully guard against something like this happening again. My report was presented to Parliament by the Home Secretary in March of last year. And in June of last year, the Home Secretary announced that she was going to be accepting all 30 of my recommendations and that the Home Office would therefore be implementing all 30 of the recommendations. And bringing matters right up to date, in September of last year, the Home Office, through the Home Secretary, presented before the House its comprehensive improvement plan, and that set out its plans for addressing my report and the recommendations contained in it. I have been asked to go back a year after that plan, so that's in September of this year, to assess progress made by the department against uh, its own improvement plan and against my recommendations. So that's a bit of background. So to the scandal, what happened and why? Briefly, the report starts with the story of Veronica, who with her father, Nathaniel, went to Jamaica for a holiday in 2001. At the time, Nathaniel had lived in the UK for in excess of 45 years, and Veronica was accompanying him on what they thought was a holiday. But little did they know that uh, that was the last time in 2001 that uh, Nathaniel would see the UK because his status wasn't recognised and he was unable to return to the UK. And what happened was over the following number of years, Veronica, who was allowed back into the country, fortunately, had to travel back and forth between the UK and Jamaica, taking career breaks, so that she could return to nurse her father because Nathaniel wasn't well. He was suffering from cancer and sadly, some years later, died of cancer. The irony of it being that the reason why that happened was because amongst other things, he couldn't return to the UK where his healthcare benefits would have been free but he couldn't afford the cost of uh, looking after his health in Jamaica. So his rights were lost to him. My report goes on to tell other stories, including that of Mr. A. Mr. A came to the UK from the Caribbean in the 60s as a young child on his mother's passport. And he came here, he, he went to school here, and he held down a very responsible job. But in 2017, his employers asked him to prove his status and he was unable to do so to the required standard. The result was that he lost his job he lost his home, he became estranged from his family, and I met Mr A during one of my road shows, which was conducted during the course of the review. When he came and saw us and spoke to me about his experience, um, he was in tears. He said that he felt broken. And I will come back to uh, Mr. A, who actually also said that he just lost everything. And there are many, many more stories, 
that I could share with you, some of which are set out in the report, including the account of a middle-aged grandmother who, because she, who had worked for decades in the UK, because she was unable to prove her status, she lost her home, she lost her job, and she was held in detention and threatened with removal. And it was only as a result of the efforts of her MP and her family and supporters that her case was uh, brought to public attention and subsequently her status was granted. And sadly, that individual died uh, relatively recently. And the experiences of Veronica, Nathaniel, Mr. A, and countless others are what came to be known as the Windrush scandal. So why did the scandal happen? Well, the Windrush generation came to the UK between 1948 and 1973, answering an invitation from the British government to help rebuild the country in the post-war era. They came, they settled, made their lives here. They regarded themselves as British. And in fact, the legislation confirmed that, including the 1971 Immigration Act. But they lacked the documents to prove their status and official records weren't kept. Some people did register their status, but some people didn't. And the reason for that is that they were given various assurances that a failure to register their status would not affect their rights in any way. And my report reproduces the written assurances that were given in response to requests for information on this very subject. For example, in the various uh, publicity campaigns that were um, in place at the time. My report also reproduces an internal Home Office circular, uh, which made it clear that at the time, the Home Office didn't want to, as they put it, stimulate a flood of applications for registration because they were concerned that they didn't have sufficient resources to be able to cope with the demand. Um, and so they gave these assurances, but those assurances proved to be hollow because when successive governments set out to prove that they were being tough on immigration in the 80s, 90s and right the way through, they introduced a set of policies immigration enforcement policies, the most notable of which was the hostile, later called the compliant environment policy. And the idea of the policy was to cut off supplies to services in the expectation that those who were in the country illegally would find life so difficult that they would leave voluntarily. But the point was that the Windrush generation were British subjects and had every right to be here. They simply lacked the documents to prove it. And so over the years, when members of the Windrush generation tried to prove their status, they were asked to do so to an unreasonable standard and they got caught up in what I've called in my report, the hostile environment net. The situation is made all the worse because, as my report makes clear, on well, I think it's page 16, um, I have reproduced a Home Office circular, which again was circulated in 2006 to Home Office staff, which set out that there would be a cohort of people who, in the light of the implementation of the policy, might find it difficult to prove their status and stated that they should be treated with I think it was sensitivity and respect. Sadly that didn't happen because the Windrush group was set an unreasonably high bar that they had to prove their status and those who couldn't lost their homes, lost their jobs, lost access to public services like healthcare, and their very sense of identity. And as you've heard, in extreme circumstances, people lost um, 
their, their identity and their liberty and were removed to their country of birth, in some instances, a country that they hadn't seen for in excess of 50 years. That becomes, and I mentioned Mr. A. Mr. A, during the ritual, says, I can't believe that I've been treated like this by my beloved England. So my findings very briefly were that this represented a profound institutional failure, that the scandal was both foreseeable and avoidable, and that there were various institutional, cultural and also political factors which led to the scandal. And finally, I said that the Home Office demonstrated a culture of disbelief and carelessness, but also a culture of ignorance and thoughtlessness on the subject of race and also the history of the Windrush generation. And that's why I made various recommendations, including recommendation six, which I think is relevant today. And recommendation six of my report says that the Home Office should devise, implement and review a comprehensive learning and development programme about the history of the Windrush generation, the history of the UK and its relationship with the rest of the world, including Britain's colonial history, the history of inward and outward migration and the history of Black Britons. Why did I say that? Because when I set out uh, to carry out the review, um, I could have um, decided to, to do a fairly sort of superficial exercise and to identify recommendations that were perhaps superficial and process oriented. But the more I looked into matters, the more I thought that the issues were far more deep rooted than that. I set about learning about the Windrush generation, which in itself is a little bit embarrassing given my heritage. But I think the very fact that I had to learn about the Windrush generation to, in order to, as I felt, do justice to the review, sets out the absolute gaps that uh, were laid bare in the review. So I didn't just set out a chronological account of what went wrong and where, but I also juxtaposed that with a section that deals with the history and the contribution of the Windrush generation. Um, and that is as a result of me reading about the accounts of others far more learned than I and summarising them in my review. So finally, I would say that uh, from my discussions with members of staff in the Home Office, from the most junior to the most senior, it was clear that there was that lack of knowledge. And I described the senior officials and indeed others who were senior um, and who were perhaps responsible as um, unimpressively unreflective, but also lacking in knowledge and understanding and awareness about the history of migration but also the history of immigration policy and legislation and its impact on others. And it struck me that many of my recommendations and recommendation six is one such, could be relevant to wider government. And so that's why I'm delighted that other government departments are looking at this in terms of the cross-government um, review that, uh, and panel that has been set up. But I'm also really pleased that institutions such as your own are considering Windrush and its implications. So I think I'm bang on time and I will leave it there. Wendy, thank you. That was um, a really excellent um, overview. And 
Um, for those of you who haven't read um, Wendy's report, um, I really would um, recommend doing so. I mean, as you heard from Wendy, she, uh, the report begins by putting individual, the individuals who are affected at the heart of, of the report and telling their stories, um, which is obviously so um, important, but also explaining the, the trajectory of the hostile environment. It wasn't something that just sprung out of a, of a recent government. The hostile environment is something which can be traced back decades. I, in fact, only uh, really learned about it when I studied immigration law. I didn't learn about it when I did my, um, certainly didn't learn about it in history when I did my degree, but I also didn't learn about it when I went to law school. It was when I was doing my master's and I specialized in immigration and refugee law that I, that I learned about it. So it's absolutely something which you know, a lot of people um, in this country won't, um, won't be studying. We already have lots of questions, which is wonderful, but we'll, get, we'll, we'll, we'll take all the questions um, at the end and please keep on putting your questions in the box. Let's have some nice, tough questions for, um, for our panelists. And I'm gonna move on now to Alex. Alex is going to uh, talk about the, the history and the politics of immigration in the UK and um, put, put, put it in that context. Alex, over to you. Thanks so much, Sam, and, uh, and thanks, Wendy, for, for, for that brilliant presentation. And, um, and thanks to the organisers for inviting me. Um, yeah, I, I want to reflect uh, a little bit on the, on the sort of paradoxes and puzzles around uh, the politics of immigration but in particular, the use of evidence by policymakers uh, and how we get to where we got uh, in terms of the, uh, the findings of Wendy's report. So why do liberal states such as the UK end up pursuing policies that are associated with such adverse impacts on people, whether that be uh, discriminatory, structurally, uh, you know, or, or even in terms of exploitation uh, and modern slavery? So how can we explain that? Um, so I'll just give a little bit of a historical perspective on the politics of immigration, thinking about just a couple of key turning points in the story of British immigration policy and think about how evidence or what types of evidence uh, were crucial at those turning points. Uh, I should declare my conflict of interest is that I am, as uh, I think Kate mentioned and Sam mentioned, the, the research director of the Policy and Evidence Centre. So the interest in policy and evidence is something that is actually my day job now and I'm very interested in how policy making is influenced by evidence um, but uh, as you'll as you'll see uh, I'm really uh, impressed by the the evidence that's been gathered through this Windrush um, uh, investigation and I think that that evidence could actually play a very important role in the future design of politics uh, around uh, immigration. So what do I mean by um, paradoxes and puzzles? What, what I mean is that there is uh, a lot of uh, interest in how uh, policies around immigration do not seem to work very well or do not seem to make much sense. So uh, why, uh, for example, is there a gap between the intended out outcomes of politicians and then the actual outcomes? So the, the, the targets um, that were recently to be under 100,000 people net immigration or even zero immigration, which uh, was the target under uh, Margaret Thatcher. Um, when so many aspects of the way people move are beyond the control of policymakers, why, why subject yourself to such targets and fail to reach them? Um, and also I want to bring, bring the discussion to this sort of connection between immigration and modern slavery, uh, to think about the contemporary uh, situation, which I would associate with Theresa May, the simultaneous toughening of internal migration controls with a hostile environment, with the very high profile campaign to address modern slavery. How can we uh, reconcile those two objectives? Uh, some critics have argued that uh, they seem to work against one another. Um, and in fact, some argue that modern slavery policies are just driven by immigration concerns or, or a, a hidden agenda. I would argue that um, we should take a longer look at how policies have developed over time. Look at turning points where politicians have taken a sort of grand bargain approach to balance one thing against another and then the unintended consequences of these grand bargains. And I'm gonna look at three of those. But just to mention before I go into those that uh, 
immigration laws are not always exactly what they say they're about. Uh, and Exhibit A might be the first sort of recognized immigration law, the 1905 Aliens Act, which was often seen uh, or is generally seen as about restricting Jewish refugees from Russia and Eastern Europe. But the question Jewish refugees was not mentioned anywhere in the legislation and it only actually applied to second and third class passengers. Um, so likewise in relation to the Windrush generation the 1960s saw several uh, pieces of legislation where it's now been established there was a clear racist intent on the part of politicians but if you look at that legislation it was very careful wording to remove any insinuation of racism. So immigration laws are not just about regulating international movement of people they're also an expression of sovereignty, of identity, of Britain's place in the world in this case, its relationship with other countries, whether that's Europe or the Commonwealth, uh, but sometimes little thought about how those grand gestures or symbolic uh, or rhetorical flourishes actually affect uh, human beings. Exhibit B would be the 1948 Act, uh, which was really an expression of the dying embers of empire, creating an imperial concept of citizenship uh, that was then dismantled slowly but surely until it finally was extinguished in 1981. So um, the three turning points I want to just um, talk about are the first is the Hattersley equation uh, and this is uh, really I think uh, sort of crystallizes um, the, the post-war downsizing of empire and the, um, the framing of immigration in the public consciousness in, in the UK. And the equation was crystallized by Roy Hattersley who said, integration without control is impossible, but control without integration is indefensible. What this was was a balance in this case between integration and control, but the key word was control. Uh, in this case, control of the immigrant population that was seen to be a problem. So some sort of responsibility on the part of the state to ensure social cohesion but with the, the, the burden or the problem uh, being uh, laid to rest at the uh, immigrant population themselves. It's also a reference to a sort of metaphor of hospitality. It affirms the rights of the host, but also the duties of the guest uh, with the underpinning hierarchy, making it very difficult for guests to ever become hosts. Um, but what sort of social justice was created by Hattersley's equation? Um, Bob Carter argued that the, the system left people at the mercy of market forces and without sufficient race relations legislation, which came later and was perhaps not adequate, effectively constituted a, a group of workers as a form of unfree wage labor. So we have that linkage between an immigration system that renders people vulnerable to exploitation. And as we've now heard, vulnerable to all sorts of other um, compromises to their human rights. Uh, and arguably that, that linkage between immigration system and exploitation was already established with um, with uh, the Irish workers who, who were uh, brought to the metropole and the idea of um, sucking in cheap labor and uh, and the immigration system delivering that cheap labor. Um, the second turning point, uh, and I am slightly skipping through history here, is the, is the Blunkett equation. And this is really about new labor and the turn of the century and the sort of the um, the 21st century. And this was really about a renewed confidence in multiculturalism and, and actually great hopes that immigration policies might uh, at last um, cast off some of the problems uh, that, um, that, that I mentioned about uh, in the second half of the 20th century. And um, these, uh, these hopes were initially raised with the abandoned, abandonment of the primary purpose rule, uh, but then dashed uh, with the, uh, the subsequent um, legislation on, um, on asylum seekers. Uh, but we, we saw the main novelty here was, was uh, a good versus bad migration equation. So the blanket equation was the more good migration we can encourage, which would be in this case, economic migrants with skills that were needed by the economy would mean less bad immigration, which is asylum seekers and irregular migrants. Uh, described by some as the Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde of immigration policy making. So it was good if you were wanted, not so good if you were not wanted. But the precarity of this purely economic case for immigration became clear when 
evidence began to grow about the arbitrary way these rules were rendering immigrants more open to exploitation. We have a number of examples, Morecambe Bay with the tragic death of uh, Chinese uh, cockle pickers, but other cases of forced labor uncovered by the gang masters licensing authority where migrants, often EU nationals, um, became recognized as victims of forced labor, now understood as potential victims of, of modern slavery. The third equation is the Theresa May equation, which is the connection between immigration control and exploitation uh, coming more to the fore. In many ways, this is a, a turbocharged version of the two previous equations where the focus is on the extremes, uh, rhetorically even tougher in terms of control, the tough but fair um, uh, combination. Uh, the, the toughness uh, is, is expressed in the level of hostility towards unwanted migrants or uh, irregular migrants and cracking down on those that abuse the system. Uh, but then accompanying this with the deployment of an even more powerful language of social justice around anti-slavery. So we have a counterpart with the modern slavery agenda uh, and maybe even national and international ambitions to uh, renew the fight against slavery. So there we have the ultimate kindly Dr. Jekyll on the side of human rights with the, uh, the adverse effects of Mr. Hyde's hostile environment. Of course, that's caricature, it's cartoon, but politics can be reduced to such things. And I think that the lesson here of, of, um, of immigration policy is this sim simplicity of good versus bad. But the danger of that, as expressed in uh, the book uh, on Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, is that uh, it's impossible to separate the good and the bad. And the danger of trying to repress the bad is, uh, is that it can overcome the good. So what role um, evidence and expertise in these turning points? What was the evidence that informed that uh, Hattersley equation uh, about integration and control? Um, at that point, the Ministry of Labour was the one arguing to stop migration because it was seen as actually economically bad that we had immigration in, a, in a opposition to the more expansionist colonial office, which wanted to have um, an expression of empire through um, free movement of people through the Commonwealth. But the main evidence that was really at play in politics was of public attitudes and public attitudes towards newcomers. And there were assumptions about the impacts of immigration that were not based on, on evidence. The Blunkett equation was famously about evidence-based policymaking. Uh, but here the evidence was macroeconomic impacts. Um, so what is the effect of GDP uh, of uh, increased migration? And there's a very mixed legacy here because um, ultimately evidence-based policymaking was criticized from all sides, from left and from right. Um, there were some problems with um, some particular um, pieces of work where um, estimates or predictions of the number of people who might arrive um, after the opening of free movement in, in the European Union. And there was also um, uh, a scandal around foreign prisoners uh, in, in a few years later, which ultimately led to the meltdown of um, the department, which is something which we've seen uh, more than one occasion. The May equation, did that involve evidence? I think there is evidence being used in the hostile environment, but it's, it's weak evidence. I don't think there is strong evidence that the hostile environment is effective. Um, and with modern slavery, the PEC, the Policy and Evidence Center, which I'm involved with, is seeking to improve that transmission of, of evidence into the policy process. So the Windrush scandal and the, and the report when it's put together, I think is, a, is an absolutely crucial opportunity for a reset in terms of the kinds of evidence that can be brought to bear on policy, uh, particularly on immigration and on modern slavery. The evidence is about the impact of immigration rules on people's lives. And I think that's the most powerful evidence of all. In, in my view, it shows us a way forward in terms of how research and evidence can, uh, can play a role in policymaking. And that's because the stories about how rules affect people's lives cuts through some of the difficulties we've seen with evidence-based policymaking. Uh, it emphasizes the power of qualitative over quantitative methodologies, and it foregrounds human impacts uh, at the micro level over economics at the macro level, which we know 
does not always cut through. And if we just think about the challenges ahead, and I'll just finish on this point, the challenges ahead of an immigration system uh, under Brexit uh, and with um, several million European citizens facing the potential repeat of a lack of documentation uh, and a precarious future in the UK. I believe that this is the sort of evidence and this is the sort of research which is going to be essential for us to design a more equitable future immigration system. Thanks very much. Alex, uh, thank you. I mean, as you were speaking, I was I mean, thinking about the trajectory of, of, of the sort of politicization of immigration. And I mean, from the 1960s onwards, you have these Labour and Conservative governments both being tough on, on immigration. I mean, it's a it's not a it's not an issue on which we have you know a really strong party advocating unfortunately um, for immigration and as you um, mentioned some you know, the economic benefits of immigration get swallowed up by very negative um, and hostile environment politicking and conflating um, economic migration with you know such things as foreign national prisoners you know they have nothing really to do with each other um, which is um, something we can come back to in, in the question. But I want to turn now to um, Farida. Um, Farida is going to reflect on some of the current issues around training and education, the work around decolonizing um, curricula and, and her own thoughts on, on the colonial um, legacy and how it's played out in, in, uh, in her work um, as, a, as a professor. Farida, over to you. Um, thanks very much, Sam, and thanks very much for everybody who's spoken and for inviting us. Um, I'd like to pick up on, I think, something that came out of Wayne Williams's report, um, which was about the ignorance about um, how uh, people of Caribbean descent came to be in the United Kingdom. And I think this speaks to a poverty in the education system. Um, and rather than call it um, decolonization, I like to think of it as an enrichment process. Um, and one of the things that struck me in 2018 was um, a report put out by a trade magazine, uh, Bookseller, which said that 4% of the books published, the children's books published in the United Kingdom, um, featured a uh, black or a minority ethnic character. And I remember many years ago thinking, well, why did it matter? I had loved Enid Blyton as a child. And one of my greatest delights was my older daughter reading Enid Blyton's Mallory Towers and, and finding uh, the same joy in those books that I had. But when I reflected further on it and I read some more, I actually began to realize that it did matter. And I reflected back to my own childhood as one who grew up under apartheid. And I went to a, an, an independent girls school for secondary school. And I remember um, some cruel person had put Latin, French and Afrikaans one after the other. And I went to speak to the French teacher who was also the deputy headmistress, Madame Aspero, and I pointed out that I was struggling with the Afrikaans class. And the reason I was struggling with the Afrikaans class was because of the representation. So we used early readers for Afrikaans children and these early readers had only two representations of black people. There was the black male gardener and the white housekeeper, I mean, the black uh, housemaid in her quote unquote uniform. Um, and I think this reinforced stereotypes amongst some of my peers about what we could be. And I found this difficult. And so we only had to do it um, compulsorily for a year. But I reflected back on this experience when I read Barack Obama's um, dreams from my father. And he points out how he had moved to live in Indonesia with his uh, mother and her new husband. And I think that had, he got a little sister out of it as well. And at some point his mother sent him back to um, Hawaii to live with his grandparents. And in starting school in Hawaii, his peers asked him um, where his father was from. So Obama said, my father was Kenyan, at which point he was asked um, if his father ate people. And this wasn't the first and only person or the only example. I then read um, David Chariandi's very moving um, letter to his 15 year old daughter. So David Chariandi is uh, an author and academic in Canada and his parents came from Trinidad and moved um, to Canada. And his mother came as a, on a domestic workers visa because that was one of the few options open um, uh, to, to people of um, quote unquote color as they were called colored in the, in the 60s. 
And even he, as somebody who was Canadian, also had to put up with um, being asked or called a, a spear thrower, which seemed deeply problematic. Um, and his friend cracked under the pressure. His black friend just didn't make it through secondary school, but David Cheriandi obviously persevered. Now, if these were the only examples, I think you might have put it down to, well, Obama did absolutely fine, but they were not the only examples. Several more came up. Cindy Clemens, who um, was is of South African, um, African-American origin, also speaks about being asked um, whether they played with elephants and about const about living in mud huts. Now, I need to be clear, I have no struggle or problem with people. I, I grew up in a mud hut in my grandmother's mud hut growing up. So it's not about the, the location or the shelter. It is about the manifestation of the, pre of the, the prejudice. And then there was the big um, Harry Potter scandal where um, the casting of Harry po of Hermione in Harry Potter for the stage version led to a black actress being cast, and this led to um, a lot, you know, a lot of protest, leading um, J.K. Rowling to say, "Well, actually, she had she had never specified a race uh, for Hermione, so she didn't see why a black actress couldn't portray." And it was interesting the the loudness of of the complaints about this. And then I read Echo Eshon. Um, he wrote a book, Black Gold of the Sun, and then he subsequently has a couple of pieces in Grant and also in The Observer. And Echo Eshon recalls what it was like growing up in Britain in the 70s, 80s. His parents had come as diplomats. Um, and I think it bears telling, uh, reading out what he says. My racist friends, I love them. I also envied the freedom their color bestowed. Whiteness meant a lack of self-consciousness. No one pointed or laughed or sneered. No one made monkey noises or mimed the throwing of spears. It meant you could lose yourself in a game of war or British bulldog in the playground without being yanked from the fantasy by a shout of wog. And then to conclude this section in terms of giving examples of why it matters, there is Rene Ede Lodge, who has been huge, especially in the last year because of her book, um, Why I'm No Longer Talking to White People About Race. And she's a young woman, she's possibly 30. Um, and she grew up in South London, one of the most diverse cities on the, in, uh, on, in the world. Um, and she speaks of what it was like to be in a classroom with other children um, as the only black child. And she says, I have memories of my little white classmates girl classmates trying to convince me that because my skin was black, my tongue was black too. I have memories of an art teacher encouraging my class to draw our beautiful blue eyes whenever we got the crayons and sugar paper out. Everything around was so starkly white that I began to believe that I would turn white sooner or later. I was quietly being written out of the narrative of humanity in my immediate surroundings. And that is something that Echo Eshoan wrote, which left me in tears, which is one day Echo Eshoan went home and he tried to scrub himself with a Brillo brush because he wanted to scrub the black out of himself um, because that is how self-filled with um, self-loathing he became. Tells me that actually it does matter what a child grows up seeing and um, two American academics who've written about children's rights and literature point out how what we see, um, what we read, what children are taught in a way influences what we become as adults. So it's not surprising in employment, for example, that black and minority ethnic people have, ha have lower levels of being hired because if you're a white child who's only ever grown up, that's why I gave you the example of uh, my, my um, Afrikaans, um, book, who's only ever grown up with images of uh, white men with little briefcases, I was a child of the 70s and 80s, um, going to, you know, uh, uh, public sphere jobs, then it isn't surprising that you don't think that these people, quote unquote, belong. And so it made me think, it made me reflect not only about the 4% statistic, but about what this means if the Echo Eshoans and the Rene Ede Lodges are so alienated by the education that they're receiving in their own countries that they want to scrub themselves white. And 
it made me think as a human rights lawyer about when we talk about the right to education, what is it that we mean exactly? And I think when we talk about the right to education, yes, it must be available, but it must also be accessible, not only geographically and economically, and it is because education is free in this country, um, if you want to go to state school, but part of accessibility is without discrimination. And what these stories are telling us is that there was discrimination inadvertent, perhaps sometimes, um, but deeply hurtful. And I think hurtful not only of the black children um, who were impacted, but also of their peers who were so poorly educated that all they knew about this place, country called Africa was that people threw spears and everybody had their own elephant to play with. Um, and you ask yourself how first world country or countries, Canada, I've given examples of Cherry Andy, um, Obama um, and um, Ede Lodge and also Eshon in the United Kingdom can be so poorly educated themselves and their peers that they have that level of ignorance. And I think there is some irony here because people like me who were brought up and grew up under apartheid and who had, I've had a very colonial education. Um, so I'm perfectly all fair talking to you about, you know, Hardy and Austin, but I've never read an African book as part of my education. So I always thought it was really ironic that people like me who come from quote unquote, the colonies know so much more about you than you know about us. Um, and the double irony is we are still patronized, excluded, uh, which is what Wendy's report points to, despite the fact that we've actually had to have plural educations and not just one. And the singular education that I think has been provided to the children in the West is so um, bereft of content, content about others' humanity, that the outcomes that Wendy speaks of are possible. And so in terms of human rights, it struck me that the third thing that you have to think about, we've had available, we've had appropriate include, I mean, um, uh, accessible, including without discrimination, is that it must be appropriate. And this means appropriate in terms of um, culture, uh, in terms of inclusivity, um, but it must also be of good quality. So it's three A's in a Q, available, accessible, appropriate, and of good quality. And an education that leaves children so ignorant cannot be an education that is of good quality. So we have failed our children. And the second thing, and the, in terms of moving on to make the bridge, is the United Nations Children's Rights um, Committee is the committee that oversees the United Nations Children's Rights Convention. And human rights committees produce what we call interpretive statements, um, expanding and explaining how certain rights are to be um, implemented by states. And it strikes me as really important that the first one that the Committee on the Rights and Welfare of the Child issued, the first general comment or interpretive statement was on the aims of education. And the aims of education, if you focus on paragraph 11 of this general comment, is on tackling racism, um, tackling xenophobia, ensuring that the aims of education are to engage, um, to explain historical reasons for racial discrimination, and also to think about how communities, plural, um, can work towards uh, producing a society and children whose education um, clearly understands and appreciates our shared humanity and our common um, goals and interests. And it also takes on board other things that are contemporary at the moment, you know, climate change environment. And so having had the critique, a part of me has spent a lot of time wondering how it is that we can make education um, public education, not just school education, accessible, because I think lawyers and human rights people and academics speak uh, to each other and we don't necessarily speak to the world. And instead of reading law books and journals, I have to confess, um, I hope none of my employers are paying attention to this talk, uh, that I've been reading poems and I've been reading novels and I've read an awful lot of them. And so I've had to kind of think, how am I going to explain my last three years entertainment? So I wrote a book. And the book that I wrote was on migration and uh, the use of literature in terms of engaging human rights. 
Um, and in that I was influenced by the Todris and Higginbotham, you know, the book I told you about that said, you know, you have to teach children uh, in, in an inclusive way and in terms of literature as well. And so I wanted to identify one of my favorite books that I read. I read many, many books, but uh, I wanted to link up a child's, a children's rights book written in 1969 um, by Nina Borden, uh, written, and it's called The Runaway Summer, um, The Runaway Summer. And so Nina Borden actually wrote it. I've never met her and I haven't read any background in terms of what, well, I can tell what the stimulus was. The stimulus for Nina Borden was the, um, a response to the 1968 um, Com Commonwealth Immigrants Act. So the 1968 Commonwealth Immigrants Act was um, an attempt by the government um, to limit East Asian and quote unquote colored immigration. Um, so there'd been a 62 act and then the 68 act was specifically to try and limit this type of migration. And part of the reason for that was a recognition that actually there was an expansion of or more people from East Africa, East African Asians coming. And, you know, we could have, you know, go one step back in terms of our history about how East Africans ended up, how, how um, a, a South Asian uh, background people ended up in East Africa and that was because you know they were brought as endangered laborers so it was a double colonial project um, and so Nina Borden tells the story um, of a young boy called Krishna and we first meet Krishna as he's landing on a beach and they're two English children Mary and Simon who are playing on the beach. So Mary has been, her parents uh, live in London. Uh, her parents, I think, are about to separate, but she's visiting granddad and auntie. Um, and she hangs out with Simon, who's the son of a policeman. And so they spend time together on the beach and they see uh, these men arriving on this boat and then running away uh, and leaving this little boy called Krishna, but they don't know his name's Krishna. So they talk to him, well, they talk about him so they, Mary said, we have to help him. And uh, Simon says, well, we don't know where he's from or what, what he's doing here. You know, my father's a policeman and they say that there are a lot of illegal, and this is the word that he uses, there are a lot of illegal immigrants coming from Pakistan. What they don't seem to realize is Krishna is a very um, well-heeled young man. So Krishna says, Krishna says, um, I am from Kenya. My name is Krishna Patel. I am a British subject. Um, and so Krishna explains how he got, he got there. So what happens with Krishna is his parents um, understood that the Commonwealth Immigration Act, Immigrants Act was coming into being. They wanted to get him out quickly to come to London to, uh, to stay with his uncle. So they send him out on the, one of the last possible flights out of Kenya, and it's supposed to be via Charles de Gaulle, except that they can't make the connecting flights for all sorts of technicals. So he has to get to the United Kingdom. He has to get to England before the, 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 the act comes into being. So he comes in through this boat. And so then Mary has a dilemma. Simon, her friend says, they have to tell the police, i.e. my dad, because he's an illegal immigrant and they have to be put in prison. And that's the end of that. Mary, on the other hand, goes home to her parent, to her grandfather and her aunt. And so she says, well, what if we found somebody? And she, the grandfather explains, eventually she spits it out. And she said, well, you know, what happens if there's somebody, um, um, you know, um, who arrived and we don't know why, I mean, he's kind of, anyway, he's a, he's a little Indian boy and he's come on a boat. And they said, Indians from Kenya are rather special kind of immigrant. Kenya used to belong to England. When Kenya became independent, the Indians who lived there were afraid they would be badly treated under an African government. So they were offered British passports just in case. And now things have gone wrong. They're not being ill-treated by the Africans exactly, but things are being made difficult for them in the way of jobs and schools for their children and so on. A lot of them have decided to use their British passports to come and live in England but our government has just passed a new law saying they can't come after all, at least not of right. They've got to take their turns with all the other people who want to come. It's, it's disgraceful, Aunt Alice said, going back on our word. And the going back on our word is exactly what Wendy Williams's report is about. It's about people who came um, because they were invited and then having done the work, having built the country, um, they're told that they're not welcome and that they're not British after all. 
And so what I love about this book is actually for, you know, nine to 12, 13 year old children, it explores really complex um, legal moral dilemmas and it does so in a really accessible way. Um, I won't spoil it for you. But the reason I think it's important is because at the time that this book was written, there was also this um, case being brought to the European um, Commission and Court, which was on East African Asians, you know, saying that the United Kingdom had reneged, was had breached their rights in terms of refusing them entry. Um, and, you know, they said actually they had been treated, the court said they had been treated as second class citizens. And there was a follow up to this, um, and then you can wave at me, Sam, if I've taken up all my time. But there was a follow up to this, and the follow up came in the form of a lecture given by um, Lord Leicester. And the lecture was given by Lord Leicester in uh, 2002. And the significance of Lord Leicester's lecture um, was the fact that he, as a young lawyer, had represented the East African Asians. Um, in the in the 68, 69 case, early 70s. And so he said in 2002, he said the lessons, we need to learn lessons from that original case, the runaway summer case. Um, and he pointed out that at the time there had been um, a few of uh, the people who had come had been put in prison, not detention center, they'd just been put in ordinary prison, not many, not for long, but they had been put in prison. And he said, we must be alive to the change in the tone um, of our discourse to make sure that we don't let this happen again. 2014, 2016, we have two new immigration acts that do what? Um, suspend the right to appeal, uh, put people in detention. And I say put people in detention, I need to be clear, put black and brown bodies in detention uh, because I do not know of many white Australians, South Africans, Canadians who end up in um, detention. And part of what we have to engage with here is the media representations of uh, quote unquote migrants, you know, why is it that people like me are here and not in France? Well, I told you about the, I didn't tell you about the French class, but I did A-level French. I don't think I'd have survived on Puy Javois, you baguette, whereas I speak English and it's absolutely fine. And so we need the history that explains how we got here. We need to be um, spoken of, not in a kind of deficit way, uh, but in a way that says that people are contributors to the, you know, to the country that uh, um, people's histories are intermingled. And I think um, I could have gone on and told you about several more books, but I want to um, make sure that we stick to time. And so I just want to say that in terms of expanding curricula, it is not only a human right for children, uh, not just the ones from black and brown uh, families, but actually for, for everybody. Um, and I think it is an opportunity for us to enrich ourselves and also to do it in a way that is enjoyable. So I'll pause now. Farida, thank you. Um, you've packed a huge amount in there. I mean, uh, just a couple of um, thoughts. Um, first of all, I mean, I'm so glad you talked about the, the literature uh, side of things. I've been um, thinking a lot about the work of um, Bernadine Evaristo at the moment and her narrative of how you know, it, she, I mean, she was publishing amazing stuff for a, um, a, a long time, but it wasn't until she won the Booker Prize, of course, that she got the, the you know the recognition which she should have had um, all along. And the work of um, Alex Wheatwell as well, who has um, published um, a large number of books. I remember reading an article um, that he wrote in the Guardian, and he said I, 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 he published ten books, but in fourteen years he'd been invited to one literary festival. Um, you know, again, speaks volumes about. The, um, the sort of marginalization of non-white writers. Um, and I think back at my own um, education, to the extent that there were um, narratives about you know, non-white um, characters, fictional characters, or I was you know, given you know, fict uh, well, fiction or non-fiction, it was often American. So the black British history wasn't there and I'm seeing that unfortunately I'm seeing it you know replicated in my own children's um learning at school they're learning about the American civil rights new movement which on one level is great but without making the um you know, the joining the dots back to empire and back to um British history um so it's you know again it's almost like learning about things that have happened somewhere else without learning about um our own um history um, 
so we've got um, a number of questions and um, please do keep putting your questions in. So I want to um, go back to Wendy, um, if I may, and um, Alex, if you want to also put your video back on again, that would be great. Um, Wendy, um, we've got a, a couple of questions about the, um, about the Windrush scandal. Um, one from um, Sean Mataluko, why do you think the investigation into Windrush scandal and the subsequent compensation scheme were restricted to those impact who come from the Caribbean? Um, I asked because the National Audit Office and journalists like Amelia Gentlemen have pointed out that people from many other Commonwealth countries have been negatively impacted by um, same immigration laws um, and policies. And that's obviously something that Frida has um, spoken about as well. So, Wendy, do you want to speak about um, that? Yes, uh, thank you for the question. It was members of the Windrush generation as a cohort who'd been caught by the hostile environment policy specifically. Uh, and that's the reason why I was asked to carry out the review in the confines that was set. But I have to say that in doing the review itself, I mentioned that I ran a series of roadshows and at a couple of the roadshows, which were carried out across country, um, there were, and it was a small but, um, but, but nonetheless very definite group of individuals who came forward from other parts of the Commonwealth and who said, we've been affected, I've been affected, but um, they weren't represented in either the case files or indeed the research that had been done. And so the review was confined to uh, those from the Caribbean who also were specifically affected by certain um, legislation, legislative uh, acts. However, I would refer you, and I suppose uh, I should, if others are going to, I should plug uh, my reports. I see that Bonavera has done the same. But if I refer you to my report, because of that small but significant number who came forward from elsewhere in the Commonwealth, recommendation five of my report asks the, the, the to look further, to look beyond the Caribbean and to look at the experiences of others who may have been similarly affected. The idea being that uh, if they've been similarly affected, they should uh, be given, they should have their status regularised and that should be recognised. Great, thank you. I'm going to um, um, turn to a couple of questions um, for, for Alex um, now, if I can. One from um, Krishnendu Mukherjee. Um, would a UK law requiring mandatory human rights due diligence insist in tackling modern slavery um, in the UK and abroad? And um, a question from um, F. Gooch, thinking about colonial legacy, are there links between historical land grabs and immigration? Alex, do you want to um, tackle those? Um, the, I mean, the first one, to, uh, we'll, we're going to be obviously speaking more about supply chains and modern slavery in our next um, event on the 22nd of February, but you might want to say something about that. Yeah, so that's a, about human rights due diligence. Um, that companies would be required to undertake. Is that right? As part of their operations, it's a slightly different topic, but yeah, I, I mean, uh, yeah, the, it's it's a fairly live debate because the existing requirements are seen as sort of less than adequate for protecting the human rights of workers in supply chains. I'm not convinced yet that, uh, you know, strengthening due diligence will correct that. Partly because of my own experiences of due diligence procedures, which actually, uh, sometimes have a sort of unintentional effect of uh, making it more difficult to have equitable relations with uh, with companies in, in in other countries. So, you know, the, the more we ramp up the 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 requirements from say a UK-based 
uh, entity, uh, the more difficult it is to work with uh, partners in other parts of the world. Um, so due diligence can be sort of exclusionary uh, if it's not implemented right. So there's some, I think there's more, more downside than upside possibly there. Um, the other question was about historical um, land grab, I think, um, and, and maybe the connection with um, the immigration debate. Yeah, so the, the, um, the historical land grabs which took land from communities to give to UK businesses. Yeah, I mean, I, I would actually see the, so the, basically the colonial um, history of, um, you know, the UK basically invading, settling without invitation is very much part of the underpinning fear, uh, I believe around newcomers to the UK, because of course, if, um, you know, if, if it was sort of understood at the time that there was a right for British people to go and take whatever they wanted from wherever they wanted, then the arrival of people in, the, in Britain would, would, would basically um, give the same fear that the, the same thing would happen in reverse. So in, in some senses, the fear about immigration is somewhat linked to the guilt of, of, um, of the colonial project. And I think that's sort of an underpinning, really almost unconscious sort of understanding of why we fear people might come to the country and impose their laws, impose their uh, culture, because of course, that was something that British people did in the past. So it's also linked, of course, to the whole debate around reparations, um, which we haven't really um, had time to go um, to go into. But I mean, you know, there's a huge defensiveness about yeah, about that subject um, overall. I mean, one of the um, um, MPs in, in Dorset um, has recently been um, you know, attacked um, in the in, in the in the Guardian for sort of denying that there should be anything done about his family links to plantations in in Barbados and and this is obviously something which has been taken up um, by um, by the UCL legacy um, project and this sort of examination of, of, of the past and also by academics in, in the Caribbean. Um, Sir Hilary Beckles has spoken a lot on the issue of re reparations. Um, Farida, I wonder if we can um, um, bring you in now. Um, a question of really what we do about the past. What do we do about um, statues um, to you know, which have been erected um, to, to slave owners, which make no mention of, of slavery. Um, what do we do about you know houses, historic houses, which have got you know links to slavery? Um, what, do, what do we do with all of this? Ah, the statute and historic houses are above my pay grade and I don't, <laughs> I'm not brave enough to take on the Daily Mail. Um, I think uh, I will defer to David Olusoga, um, Oliveto Telly, and I think uh, in Leicester they're looking at historic houses. Um, I'm Zimbabwean, so I grew up at Cecil John Rhodes, to be perfectly frank with you. Uh, my summer job in university uh, was at an insurance company that was directly opposite some place that used to be called Cecil Park, which is laid out. The park is laid out in the shape of a, a British flag, a union, a union flag. Um, and if you stood up high enough when, when I was growing up, you could see a statue of Cecil uh, Rhodes. So the Zimbabwean government's response to Rhodes when Rhodes must fall started is uh, Cecil Rhodes is actually buried in Zimbabwe in, uh, in a, on an outcrop of rocks called uh, Matopas, um, which I went to once in 92, I think. And so the Zimbabwean government said, we've got him six feet under and we're going to keep him there. Um, but I think what people are engaging are these statues, which are a little bit higher. Um, and I don't think there's anything that I can add, you know, besides context. Um, I wanted to pick up on something that Alex said, which was um, this idea of um, linking up with historical um, issues and what you talked about also in terms of reparations. And I have this great quote from Kuruma from his book, uh, Revolutionary Path, which he wrote in 73. And he tells 
uh, migrants, uh, that you are in Britain, not by chance or by choice. You are in Britain for historical reasons. You are in Britain because Britain colonized you and reduced the various countries to which you belong to the level of colonial status. You are in Britain because British neocolonialism is strangling you in your home countries. Where else can you go to seek survival except in the mother country, which has enslaved you? Um, Senyerere, who was the first president of, um, of uh, Tanzania and a great Pan-Africanist um, and who actually translated um, Shakespeare's Julius Caesar into Kiswahili as well, just by the by, um, understood this link from the very beginning. So he wasn't you know, telling people not to come. He said, no, no, you're going home. You know, you're going back to your granny's village. Uh, so you go along and you, you know, you, you make yourself comfortable. And I think that's important to keep making these kind of um, historical links um, that they may be unwilling on one part, but since they're there, we need to engage them. Great. Thank you. OK, I'm going to go back to um, Wendy um, now. Um, this is a question from uh, Lawrence Lustgarten. Um, did you conclude that the UK government had acted illegally in treating people in this horrible fashion? If so, do you think they were aware of the illegality but decided to go um, ahead anyway? And of course, Wendy, you had um, incredible access to Home Office officials at all levels um, and you interviewed um, a huge number of people um, when you were doing the report, as well as obviously the families and the people who were directly affected. Um, so yes, what, are, what, what thoughts on that question? Um, this was quite a, a knotty issue. And thank you very much for, for, for the question because um, going back to my report, please forgive me, Alex and Farida, going back to my report, um, I do talk about the limitations of the review so it wasn't a legal assessment. It, it wasn't a public inquiry with witnesses giving evidence under oath um, and full disclosure rules and everything else that would have flowed from that. It was a lessons learned review. So it was much more informal and less legalistic. Having said that, uh, you'd be forgiven for thinking that I was a lawyer because the report itself does contain quite a lot of legalese. And to summarise, I wasn't able to conclude that the department had acted illegally, as you say, but I was able to prove that um, the department should have foreseen what happened and hopefully I was able to, to demonstrate the devastating impact of the department's activities on individuals who'd contributed so much to the UK. It would have taken a, a formal inquiry with everything that that would entail to have enabled me to reach those sort of legalistic findings. But I do think that having the opportunity to carry out an informal review provided various opportunities such as such as you know people shared things with me sam you've pointed out i mean i spoke to i think it was nearly 800 people who'd either been affected or who had effected the uh, policies and procedures that led to Windrush. And in speaking to that wide range of individuals and groups, people felt able to share information with me, which I think under other circumstances, you know, without that protection of confidentiality, might have prevented me from getting to the truth of what happened, uh, or the whole process might have taken much, much longer to get to that stage had it been constituted differently. So that's my long-winded way of saying that I wasn't able to prove illegality, but uh, hopefully I was able to prove injustice. Mm 
I mean, while Wendy, while you've, we've got you um, um, in the hot spot, as it were, I mean, I wanted to ask you, following up from that, um, about your view on, you know, where we go from from here with with Windrush. You're obviously going to remain involved. The government has accepted every single one of your recommendations, and which is amazing. And yet, we've recently seen a senior lawyer resign over the compensation scheme, describing it as systemically racist and unfit for purpose. We've also seen the level of compensation rise exponentially. Very recently, there was a cap on impact of life, which was lifted from 10K to 100K suddenly. But we've also see, see that only 3% of those affected have received compensation. I mean, are you optimistic, ultimately, about what will happen and whether justice will be done each and individually for the, for the Windrush generation? I would say that I'm hopeful. Uh, as to whether I'm optimistic, you know, the procedures and events will demonstrate whether there is room for optimism. But I am hopeful. You mentioned, Sam, that the department and the Home Secretary agreed to implement all 30 of my recommendations. That has to be a positive starting point. But now starts the really hard yards. And I've always made it clear that one of the indicators of success would be that those who've been affected received redress and restitution. And so part and parcel of that is not just an apology, which yes, has been given by government, by the, the previous pr prime minister and others, but it's not just an apology, it's also redress in the form of restitution. And so the compensation scheme is, has to be key as an indicator that the department has learned the lessons and has taken steps to address what has happened. And so the compensation scheme and its operation will of course form part of what I'll look at when I'm asked to review progress. But I'll end my answer by pointing out that the compensation scheme is a separate statutory scheme that is supposed to have its own independent overseer. And I believe that the department is in the process of appointing that person. So I would expect that person to carry out their own review of the scheme, of its effectiveness, of its operations to satisfy themselves that the scheme is operating as it should and that it's providing the redress that people are entitled to. Right, thank you. Um, a couple of questions following on from that um, for, for Alex. Um, I, first of all, a question from Sean um, Mataluku, and it may be either you or Frida wanted to ask this. Why do you think our present government is so reticent to include more discussion of colonial history? in our national curriculum. And I wanted to ask you about um, hostile environment and whether you think that um, we can do anything in this country to depoliticize the whole issue of immigration and whether you think the pandemic might help change the politics um, and if so, how? Lots of questions for you. You can you can choose which one <laughs> you would like to answer, or all of them. Yeah, I mean the um, um, the question about education, I think maybe is 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 Farida's territory. But you know, on a personal level, I certainly received a poor education in terms of um, uh, Britain's colonial history. You know, and and I've had to unlearn or or learn. You know, in my adult life, uh, probably like a lot of other people. Um, having said that, uh, and looking at my children's education, there is there is a difference. There has been there has been movement. I don't think it's um, it's not enough, but I think we can't say that things are the same as when I was growing up in the in the seventies and eighties uh, as they are now. And so it'd be interesting to. I think there's a lot of research that needs to be done to sort of look into that. But yeah, in terms of um, the hostile environment and um, the 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 prospects of depoliticizing uh, 
uh, I mean, that that sort of that hope to depoliticize was what I think characterized New Labour's approach to immigration. They wanted to depoliticize using economics uh, and using economic arguments to take the politics out. And of course, that that did backfire. Um, and I do think that if we if we try and depoliticize using simply uh, expressions of contribution of uh, of, of benefit uh, of particular uh, groups to the UK, that is a weak argument for uh, a depoliticization of immigration. I think we need to take a more human centered approach because why should everyone contribute? <laughs> why should we all be uh, profitable uh, to the country we live in? What happens if we're not able to be profitable uh, to the country we live in? I think it, sh it should be more about right to be here, right to be. Uh, and um, so that's why I feel the evidence that we now have on Windrush is so valuable because it talks, it, it, you can see there the human impacts of unintended consequences of, of immigration uh, controls and how those hit families and generations that they weren't even intended to, to, to target. And, and I, what I'm really interested in is where this is now being mainstreamed into other departments across government. That there's an opportunity here that there's obviously that there's the need to, to, to compensate the victims of that particular uh, injustice, as Wendy said, but the opportunity there to sort of change the way we do policy is really a, a, an amazing prospect. Uh, again, I mean, I, I would say that um, it's going to be um, difficult because depoliticizing immigration is something that we've really struggled with over the years. I think the pandemic might actually make things worse in some respects because of the restrictions on mobility that are actually affecting families. And, you know, really, you know, really people are really suffering because of the immobility that has been imposed. And I'm not a, you know, I'm not a fortune teller, but it looks like immobility is going to be uh, a key feature of the immigration system for maybe years to come and that I, I am worried about the um the human cost of that and the and the division of families that uh, we, we're seeing now temporarily and, and that the, the fear that that might be made permanent so actually i'm i'm hopeful about some of the aspects and really worried about other aspects right i mean certainly the i mean what's happening now in terms of my clients you know who are in detention centers in the middle of a pandemic has been very frightening in terms of you know lots of um support being cut financial support um being cut you know it's not it's not been um a good picture and there's a, you know the announcement of the government which was obviously right absolutely right to say those who are undocumented you know are going to be vaccinated of course that's right but as you know so many people who have been working in this area have pointed out you can't just suddenly switch from hostile environment to um suddenly you know saying oh it's all fine come forward and, and, and assume that people will come forward because the culture has been so hostile people are you know uh, are very nervous about about coming forward um in, in the present time so uh, Farida let me just throw of, of why the, the government is so reticent to include more discussion of colonial history in the national curriculum um, perhaps to you and also I just wanted wondered whether you wanted to reflect too on something that um, Kahinda um, Andrews has been talking about um, he's um, in his sort of role as a professor of black studies saying that he doesn't think that it's necessarily um, the, you know, he thinks it's more beneficial to try and look at um, talking about um, these issues from the bottom up, you know, talking about them in, in primary schools, talking about them in extracurricular um, environments, and that the work that's done at the universities on this in terms of decolonization of a curriculum is much less important than what's going on at the grassroots level. Oh, I agree with that. I agree with Gainda. I, I agree with his analysis, actually, um, because I think universities are not necessarily uh, placed. I think by the time somebody gets to university, their ideas are not not completely set. Um, but I think 
their, their earlier opportunities to engage. That's why I like talking about young children. I think what Alex said about um, the curriculum changing is true to a point. I mean, I remember my, my two daughters, 13 and 12, and yet they still came home in primary school telling me that Captain Cook discovered Australia. Um, and I think Sam and I've had this discussion where we had to have a little um, language uh, session about what do we mean by to discover. Um, so we focused on the word to discover and we unpack that. But I think um, the reason for the government's reticence, and I don't think it's all of the government, is a perception of what you spoke about earlier, which is this idea of reparations. And you may have noticed that I kept away from the word decolonization. And I think that is because to um, quote something that Hillary Clinton said in respect of um, the, the, the phrase um, best interest of the child when she was a children's rights lawyer, she said it's been come a slogan in search of a definition. The best interest of the child can mean whatever you want it to mean, depending on your context. And I think decolonization possibly sometimes has multiple meanings and people start at different points um, on the spectrum in terms of discussing it. So I think part of the fear of uh, the government is possibly a perception that it is going to be used to make quote unquote white children feel bad about themselves and their history and that they should be proud of it. But I don't think that there is any contradiction in learning about history, uh, histories uh, as plural. So the Germans do this really well. Um, you know, it cannot be easy being German and talking about the Second World War constantly, but Britain quite likes that. So Britain has no problem with other people's histories uh, and challenging and difficult aspects of other people's histories. And the question becomes if the Germans can actually foreground and make Holocaust denial a crime, and that is actually hold up their history, a very difficult, tough history, um, and still be able to make progress. Um, why cannot a country uh, with also problematic histories um, not be able to contain all of those? Because we all know as people, we have strengths, we have weaknesses. Uh, we have days when we lose our temper when we should of ourselves. And so I think it's also a fear of something that you and Alex discussed, which is this idea of um, reparations. So finishing up, I think it's important that we remember that in September of this year, we're marking the 20th anniversary of the United Nations Conference on Racism, which was held in Durban, South Africa. And if you remember the theme then, it was a demand for reparations. And so Baroness Amos and Colin Powell were sent by their respective governments um, to South Africa to represent. Um, and part of that was kind of um, to engage or to try and parry this idea of a demand for reparations. But I think it is enriching for everybody, as I've said, um, to have these plural histories. I mean, this is, you, you, you studied history in, you know, at a university and you were taught about historical sources um, and weighing evidence. Um, and I think that's important. I think it is a skill that you develop and it's something that we should be, that children should be taught. And that doesn't mean that you don't have pride in where you come from. You can have pride, but I think you have to have pride in, in, in a holistic picture. We love our parents, but we recognize their weaknesses. Our parents love us, but they also recognize our weaknesses. It's possible to hold both things together. Right, and I think that your, your you know, use of the word enrichment is a very um, brilliant way of, of, of looking at this because you know, one cannot understand the present without properly understanding the past, the good and the bad. And the example that you give of, um, of, of Germany too is, is, um, is important. I mean, that, you know, the, the teaching of the Holocaust, the teaching of the um, Second World War is a required part of the cur curriculum there. And that's an interesting contrast because although we have slavery on our curriculum, it isn't mandatory to be taught. It's up to the, the discretion of individual teachers, um, in fact, as to how they teach it and whether or not uh, they teach it. So we have um, run out of time. It's been in a a really um, fascinating discussion. I'd like to say a huge thank you to uh, our three speakers, to Wendy, to Alex, and um, to Farida. We, um, if you haven't read um, Wendy's report, absolutely um, do read it. Um, Farida's given us an entire reading um, list, which will keep me going, I think, for a little while, which is wonderful. And so do copy and paste that. And um, Alex's book, um, his co-edited book,
um, on modern slavery will stand you in very good uh, stead for our uh, final event in the series, which is going to be on modern slavery um, on the 22nd of February. So do join us for that. And uh, finally, I would like to say a big thank you to um, Kate um, at the um, Bonavera and her fantastic team who've made tonight's event happen. Um, stay well all and good evening. <laughs>